this. I gave hard evidence. These scars. Hey, uh, Patrick, I started the live stream early to expose you because I'm now going to show everyone that you're another liar pretending to be a sincere person looking for sincere answers. <clears throat> okay, Patrick, you just said you read my answer. You're lying. You didn't. Patrick, I started early specifically for you because I'm going to teach people how to spot wolves pretending to be sheep. You just said you read my answer. You're, you're a liar. And I'll tell you why you're a liar. Who told you that Jesus is absent from hell? Did you actually read my answer, Patrick? Night digger. Better answer if you don't want to get blocked. See, this is why I don't have patience anymore for these people, folks. I'm sorry. May the Lord Jesus forgive me and transform me to be patient. I cannot deal with people who pretend that they're asking questions sincerely, but they think they're smart and trying to set you up. So now, Patrick, are you listening? <clears throat> yeah, I don't know if you have Hopefully the connection stays strong. Patrick. Answer quickly before I block you. Who told you Jesus is absent in hell? You didn't read my answer. You're lying because I answered that. Jesus is present in hell. Who said that God's nature and attributes are absent from hell? Which idiot told you that? Revelation 14 verses 9 to 11. So I answered you, but I don't think you're smart enough to understand the answer. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11. I even started the live stream early to expose you because you're not listening. I don't care. Tim Keller is not the Bible. Patrick, read because I'm going to block you after this because you're a wolf. Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11. Here's your answer, Patrick. And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with iron brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now, guys, is it clear that Jesus is present in hell? And then verse 11, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, nor worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So now, which moron, which idiot told you that God is absent from hell? Not even Tim Keller would be that stupid. Tim Keller is an intelligent man, and he knows that God is omnipresent. You're the, you're the guy that's too stupid to understand what it means when a Christian tells you God is absent from hell. Not that he's completely absent in the sense that his presence isn't there in some sense. He's absent from hell in the sense that he's not there to have fellowship, communion, or pour out his love and peace and mercy. He is present in hell, in wrath, in anger, in justice, in judgment. So if you're that stupid, do you don't understand what someone is saying? Don't impose your stupidity on someone. So number one, I just corrected you. Who told you Jesus isn't present in hell? Which idiot told you he's not present in hell? Revelation 14, verse 10 for our friend again. One more time. I'm going to send this guy in his merry way. It's all a matter of perspective on ontologics. It's all a matter of perspective. Good from whose perspective? Those who are tormented in hell, they think it's not good. But according to the justice of God, it is very good to punish those who deserve punishment, right? Okay, now, Patrick, are you going to answer my question and stop the tap dance that you're too stupid to understand what Tim Keller meant? Revelation 14.10, it says that they are tormented in the presence of the Lamb. Is the Lamb's presence there? Okay, watch this guy expose himself, pretending that he's sincere. <sighs> God, have mercy on us. Please forgive us, Father. Lord Jesus, forgive us. Holy Spirit, forgive us and help us to deal with such people. We don't have your love and patience, Lord. Sorry, guys, I started early for this guy who pretended to be sincere seeker. Hold on. You got less than a minute, buddy. I'm sending you on your merry way. Everyone saw Revelation 14.10, right? 
Those in hell are tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. His entire premise hinges on that God is absent from hell. What a stupid argument. Even those who believe in conditionalism can't be that stupid to argue that way, and they don't. Okay. Your time is running out, Patrick. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't tap dance. Since Jesus is present now in hell, what does that do to your argument? It decimates it, doesn't it? Yeah. Do not come to my YouTube channel. Do not come to my live sessions pretending to ask sincere questions when you're not asking sincere questions. You're trying to preach your belief and you're <clears throat> packaging it as a question because it's not you're looking for an answer. You're thinking you're going to stump someone with your logic. It only shows that you're biblically illiterate. You're illiterate. You don't know the Bible. Okay? Been there, done that, got the T-shirt, Patrick. Don't ever pull that on, on me again. See, when I gave you the answer and you ignored it, you exposed yourself. I answered you. Did you read my answers? You said that God's essence and attributes are absent from hell. I said, no, that's not true. God's attributes of justice and righteous anger are present in hell and is sustaining power because he has to be sustaining them in hell. So he can't be completely absent from hell. You said you read my response. So then why would you be so stupid to say again that God is absent from hell when I told you no, he's not? You see why I can't tolerate these guys? I answered the question. And if he was sincere, he would have read it. He did read it, but he ignored it because he realized I just destroyed his argument. He thought I was going to be stupid enough to say, oh, yeah, God is absent. See, now I got you, fam. I got you. No, see, I'm not biblically illiterate like you to fall for your stupid philosophical argument that contradicts Scripture. All right? Patrick, I want you to apologize to everyone in the room for wasting their time and mine. For making me start the live stream earlier because you pretended that you're looking for an answer. Yeah. Here's another guy taking a shot at me and masquerading as he's being nice. you got to agree with Sam, what uh, says Patrick. Find the truth. You're going to be finding another room pretty soon. All right. Patrick, you got to apologize to everyone for pretending that you're asking sincere questions when you weren't. So you notice that. See, so look at the tap dance he wants to run because, you know, he just got exposed. You see that, guys? You see he got exposed? So he's trying to be nice and gentle. These are the people that are most dangerous, those who masquerade as ministers of righteousness. And it's ironic because I was bringing that point up to the folks at Discord. I think, what's his name was there? XX Phillips, I think you were there, soldier of Christ. I said the most dangerous individuals are not the ones that are jerks in your face like Muhammad Nikab and his girlfriend Ali Dawa, because you can see how nasty they are. The most dangerous snakes, the most dangerous wolves, the most dangerous demons are those who come being nice, soft-spoken, meek, gentle, and give the appearance of being pious. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 15. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 15. Let me show you. Let me show you what I mean. So be careful of the Patricks who are so nice. I thank you for your time, Sam. I didn't want to upset you. And he thinks we're stupid to fall and are gullible enough to fall for his fake satanic meekness. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 and 15. Here Paul says it. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 15. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Now understand what you just read. In Jesus' name, in the almighty name of Jesus, as he floods us in his precious blood, the blood of the lamb purifies us, purifies us, cleanses us, cleanses us, purifies us in the blood of the Lord Jesus, the blood of the lamb, 
Cleanse us and purify us of our filth and flesh and fill us with the Holy Spirit, Father. Fill us with the Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus. Fill us, Holy Spirit, with your presence in Jesus' name. Understand what you just read. Satan knows that if he appears as Satan, <clears throat> then you can't fall for his schemes. So he appears as an angel of light, a luminous angel, a beautiful angel, because that way he disarms you and captivates you with his beauty and draws you in and then kills you dead. And Paul says, so too his children, his agents, his ministers will pretend to be ministers of righteousness. They'll promote piety and morality and purity and love and compassion and gentleness and taking care of the needy and, and feeding the, the hungry and visiting orphans. And yet they're going to preach a message that will damn you to hell. So, folks, who's more dangerous? A Jason, this guy, a Shibri Ali, who come as very humble and gentle and meek and pious and loving. And, you know, forgive me, Sam. Forgive me. Oh, thank you, Sam. Or someone like a Muhammad Ajab, who's just a nasty, wicked, vile troll. He can't help expose that he's a rabid dog. Or Ali Dawa, another filthy dog, right? Who's more dangerous? Who are you? Who will you be more prone to trust? A Shibra Ali who comes off nice and scholarly and humble and gentle? That's Satan's scheme. So choose Jesus and everyone else. Learn what you just read in 2 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 15. Satan is so smart, he knows if he gives you straight up poison, you're not going to take it. He knows that he has to cover up the poison with something enticing, something that looks good, appealing. So he gives you M&Ms, or he'll give you Kit Kat, or he'll give you Snickers, but in the center is that poison, and it'll kill you just as quickly as if he just gave you straight up poison. You with me there? Now, how does that transfer over? How does that transfer over to this guy, Jason, and Shibra Ali? They appear so nice, so gentle, so loving, and so sincere. And Oh, forgive me if I offended you. Oh, did I hurt you? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for your time. In order to disarm you, in order to deceive you into thinking they're sincere, but they're actually demons, wolves, dogs, trying to masquerade, cover up their filth, like this guy right now. You see how quickly he exposed himself? Did you guys see how quickly he exposed himself? Oh, it's not Jason. I'm sorry. Jason, if you're there, my apologies. Forgive me, Jason. It's Patrick Nydigger, right? Patrick Nydigger. And Patrick, you misunderstood. I'm going to now be charitable. You misunderstood what Tim Keller was saying about 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 9. Tim Keller is considerably smarter than you give him credit. He didn't mean that Christ is not present in any sense whatsoever because he's a Trinitarian and he believes that God is omnipresent and then God himself sustains hell. If you read him in context, which obviously you don't know how to read context because you can even read my responses, what he means is when Jesus shuts you off from his presence, it means his loving presence, <clears throat> fellowship, communion, his loving <clears throat> presence. It doesn't mean you're shut off from his presence completely. In what sense are you shut off from the presence of Christ? In the sense in which we believers will experience his presence. Because if you read 2 Thessalonians 1, 5 to 10, it's talking about Jesus Christ coming to dwell in the midst of his saints, to be marveled at by his saints, and to dwell among us. It's in that sense that he's saying the unbeliever, the wicked, will be cut off from Christ's presence. Because when Christ is present with us, he's present to flood us in his infinite love, his peace, his joy, his comfort. That's not the sense in which he's going to be present in hell. Stop misquoting or misinterpreting or misunderstanding Tim Keller. I don't understand. I love the difference when you're with Dave and Dwokab as when you are on your own channel. Think, you mean you love it when I'm different here and there? Or you love it when I'm there acting the way? I, I don't even know how to answer that one. Well, it's David's channel, so I have to be respectful to his rules, right? But I have no idea how to answer that. 
Folks, I, I started the session a little earlier than normal because I thought Patrick was being sincere and asking me a question. And yet he exposed himself in less than five minutes because I answered his question and he ignored everything I said. You guys understand what his question was? Do you want me to repeat it? Let me answer it and we begin in prayer. Yeah, don't worry about it. I'm saying you didn't mess him much. His argument was this. He wants me to answer a philosophical challenge to hell, hell being eternal. More correctly, hell being forever. I don't like to use the word eternal because eternal means eternal means timelessness. But I understand how Christians use eternal, meaning never-ending time. He's saying, see, well, hey, God is absent from hell so that God's nature and attributes are absent from hell. How then can hell be forever if some people will be punished with greater severity than others? Because somehow, if God's nature and attributes are absent from hell, then it can't be forever. Which, again, even that doesn't follow from the premises. But I already corrected him. I said, who told you God is completely absent from hell? God's attributes of perfect justice and righteous anger and a sustaining power will still be actively present in hell because in order for people to be tormented in hell, God has to be sustaining them and hell. So he is in hell, but he's not in hell to have fellowship, to have communion, and to pour out his love. He's there to express his righteous anger and perfect justice. But he ignored all that, and he still went on to ask his question. You get it? He ignored all I said, pretending that he was actually listening to the answer. And let me prove to you, God is not completely absent from hell. God is not completely absent from hell. One more time, Revelation 14, verse 10. Thank you, find the truth. The way it worded it sounds like you're trying to attack me, brother, but it's okay. I'm gun shy, remember. I'm quick to pull the trigger because I'm constantly getting attacked, which I'm not complaining. I don't care you attack me. That's part of the game of being an apologist, being the best-looking apologist in the world. That's part of it. When you're so good-looking and you do apologetics, you're going to have haters hating you and attacking you. But anyway, Revelation 14.10. Pay attention. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone, brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. Did you guys catch it? Will the lamb's presence be there in the lake of fire as people are being tormented justly so, righteously so, so due to their rebellion, due to their sins and blasphemies and immoralities and defiance and re rebellion against the holy God? Did you read it? They will be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the lamb. So this guy thought he had a philosophical argument, an airtight argument. I'm going to slam you guys who believe in everlasting conscious torment. I got you. <laughs> man, dude, go get a job, man. Right? Okay, guys. With that said, pretending that he wants an answer. Guys, one thing I'm going to tell you here. It's Q&A. We're, we're going to take questions before I pray. Because I need to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I need to be cleansed in the blood of Jesus Christ. I need to be purified in the blood of Jesus Christ. And fill the Holy Spirit to be a blessing to you in Jesus' name. And we need Jesus to pour out his blessings, his grace, his mercy, his compassion, and have pity on us in Jesus' almighty name. Okay. One thing I'm going to tell you. Here's what I'm going to tell you. Okay. This YouTube channel is for people who have sincere questions and are sincerely seeking, wanting to learn about the biblical foundation for the core doctrines of the Christian faith and be challenged to think outside of the box and see things from a different perspective from the one they've been taught. I don't mind if you ask sincere questions. I don't mind. I do not mind even if the questions are tough. I do mind if you come here to attack, to mock, to ridicule, to insult, to blaspheme, to distract, and ask questions that are not questions, but setups in order to prove your point or to prove me wrong. You're in the wrong channel. Get lost. Don't come here. I don't want you here. Okay. 
You want me there? Like Arbus. He's from another planet, right? So hopefully you understand that. Hopefully you understand that. Does everyone understand that? The same way you were created, Adam Seeker. Satan was created the way you were created and your parents were created by God. What's the next question? Now, with that said, I really need the Lord Jesus to crucify my flesh, to destroy my flesh, to save me from the stain of my flesh and the fruits of my flesh. And I really need the Holy Spirit to fill me with fruit from the Spirit, with life from the Spirit, with knowledge and wisdom, understanding and faithfulness and holiness and purity from the Holy Spirit. I need the Father to drown me, and I pray for, for all of you. Father, drown every one of us in your living waters, your Holy Spirit. Father, please have mercy on us. Please, Father, for the sake of the Lord Jesus Christ, save us from our flesh. Save me from my flesh. Save me from the desires of my flesh and giving in to my flesh. Give me the power. Give us the power of the Holy Spirit to war against the flesh, to despise the flesh, to die to the flesh. Father, please give us holiness to delight your heart. Give us the grace to be more like Jesus. And Father, I ask for the gifts of patience to be patient, Father. Please save us, save me from impatience and unrighteous anger to be angry righteously. Holy indignation and not to sin in my anger, Father. Save us from our flesh. Crucify our flesh. Mortify our flesh, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, by the life of your Spirit. Purify us in the blood of Jesus Christ. And please have mercy on us, Father. Please, Father, be patient with us and give me the grace to be more like Jesus Christ, especially to my brothers and sisters, to be patient with them and to love them and to serve them and to endure <clears throat> As you put up with us, as you're patient with us, as you love us and you endure <clears throat> our shortcomings, Father. Father, bless this session by the power of the Holy Spirit. Fill my lungs and my chest and my throat with the breath of life. Anoint my mouth to speak clearly without error. And bless the sound of my voice to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. Please, Bobby. Abba, Avinu, please, Father. Please, Holy Father. Righteous Father, please, for the sake of Jesus. Have mercy on us. Wash us in the blood of Jesus Christ and bless this session. And give me wisdom and knowledge from your spirit to interpret scriptures correctly. And to be patient and loving and kind and compassionate to, towards my brothers and sisters. Bless them who are here and those who will listen. Fill them. Wash them. Wash me. Wash our loved ones. Wash our children, our family members. Wash my daughters in the holy blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lamb. The blood of the Lord Jesus. Because by the blood of the Lamb, we conquer in Jesus' name. We love you, Father. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Lamb of God. We love you, Holy Spirit, the eternal Spirit of the Father and Son. Have your way in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, Spirit. And bless the strength of the internet connection, Father, to stay strong. And use these meager efforts in Jesus' name. Yahovah, Father, Son, Spirit. I actually got attacked, I told you the other day. Ah, praying for the internet connection and buffering. What a waste of prayer. Folks, let me repeat again. And this is Q&A. There were two questions from yesterday. I don't know if I'll get to them. Maybe we'll entertain new questions. Ask me the questions and ask the Holy Spirit to guide me to see which question the Spirit wants me to answer first. Let the Holy Spirit have his way. His will be done and crucify our flesh and fill us with life and the fruit of the Spirit in Jesus' name. Folks, even your internet connection is a blessing from the triune God. Even the iPhone that you use is a blessing from the trying God. Anything and everything that has made your life easier and more enjoyable, that is a blessing. That is a grace of the trying God. You could have been born over 100 years ago. And over 100 years ago, you would have no phone, right? You would have no internet, no television. In fact, what? Over 100 years ago, even no cars and planes, right? Anything and everything that has made your life much easier, more beneficial, more fruitful, that's the gift of the grace of the triune God. Praise him even for your internet. Praise him even for your connection. Praise him even for your phone and your cars and your television and the planes. Praise him for everything that has made your life more enjoyable. For the morphine that they use for cancer patients, in order to dull the pain of cancer, everything, even when it comes to pulling your teeth, right? Can you imagine 
having your teeth pulled over 100 years ago, or if you needed your leg amputated over 100 years ago, the pain and the misery, thank you for anesthesia. Guys, we take too much for granted so that someone stupid could say, are oh, you praying for the internet connection? That shows you someone who's spoiled and of the devil that doesn't even want to thank God for something like the internet connection because to her, internet connection is no blessing. Really? Now, with that said, everything that God has given you for good, you can then misuse for evil. So it is unfortunate, though God has blessed us to discover the internet. There are people using the internet to promote evil and sin and to advance the agenda of Satan. May the Father of our Lord Jesus save us from that. Forgive us when we misuse these blessings. Forgive me and save me from misusing these blessings. And use these blessings for the kingdom of Christ, for holiness and purity and love and worship of the triune God. Right? So I want to remind you of that because for someone to leave that kind of comment, chiding me for asking God for strong internet connection, shows you that how ungrateful she was. And it was a she, a demon. How ungrateful. In fact, just earlier, just to tell you, James White was doing a live DL show, Dividing Line. He had to shut it down because his internet connection went kaput. And no DL, no dividing line. You see? You with me there? Yeah, it went kaput just an hour ago. I was watching it, and as I watched, kaput, the internet provider, right, failed him. So no DL. That's my point. The fact that the internet is staying strong, that's the gift of his grace. Whether you like it or not, whether you acknowledge it or not, this is something good and everything good is from him. So praise him even for the internet connection. Do I even have to say that? Do I even have to say that? Okay, let me show you. Every good thing that's beneficial to you, that makes your life more enjoyable, that you don't misuse and use it as sin against God, but glorify God is a blessing of God. James 1.17. I was going to turn on the light, but forget about it. I was going to turn on the light, but forget about it. James 1.17. Look at that. This angle right here. See? Look at my neck. How skinny I'm getting. In Jesus' name, may I burn off the rest of the weight by the fire of the Holy Spirit. Okay, James 1.17. James 1.17, thank the admins, the mods, thank Protestant for serving us by posting verse away. Every good gift, every good gift, and every perfect gift, not some, every good gift, and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He doesn't change, right? A shadow changes, right? It becomes long, it becomes short. He doesn't. He remains the same. He is constant and consistent. Okay, that's one verse. John 3, 27. That's one verse. So let me remind you, you better be thankful for your car and praise God for your car. Praise God for your internet. Praise God for your iPhone. Praise God for the TV. Praise God for the refrigerator. Praise God for all of it. John 3, 27. John answered, and said, a man can receive nothing except if it be given him from above. Anything you have that prospers you, that brings you enjoyment and benefit, it's from above. Uh, otherwise, you wouldn't have it. Okay? 1 Corinthians 4. Let's read 6 and 7. The key verse is 7. It's sad that I have to even do this because she upset me the other day. Praying for the internet connection. No, maybe you should thank God for your for your wig. You bald little bat. Just kidding. I don't know if she was bald or not. Okay. First Corinthians 4, 6 to 7. Key verses 7. And these things, brethren, I have a figure, I have in a figure transferred to myself. Notice these things I have applied to myself. I have in a figure transferred to myself, meaning I've applied it to myself. I'm applying this standard to myself, not just to you, to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us, learn from us, learn from our example, emu emulate us, imitate us, 
not to think of men above that which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. Now notice verse 7, verse 7. For who maketh thee to differ from one another? Who makes me different from Protestant believer? Who makes Protestant believer different from first and last? Who has given me different gifts than the gifts that Protestant believer has? Who has given Al D his unique gifts that are different from the unique gifts given to Zena, the triune God? Not you, not me, the triune God. Now notice what else he goes on to say. And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? What do you have that you didn't receive? Ah, whatever you have, you received it as a gift of grace. Even the health that you have to work, you received it from God. Even the job that hired you, you received it from God. Even the paycheck that you deposit in your account, you received it from God. What do you have that you did not receive? And if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Let's post that one more time. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. Exactly, Vine. You got it. That too. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 7. One more time. Let's read it one more time. Okay. Notice here. CJ, notice what CJ said. I'm on disability right now, guys. And I wish I could still work. It's a blessing to be working. Notice, you take advantage the health you have that allows you to get up in the morning and go to work. CJ doesn't have that advantage. But now notice the blessing that God has given CJ. CJ is still being taken care of, right? And because I'm sure you receive disability benefits. So even then, God has not abandoned CJ. And CJ, thank you. I hope you got my email thanking you. Lord bless you tremendously. Okay, now 1 Corinthians 4, 7, one more time. One more time, read with me. Okay, one more time, read with me. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. For who maketh thee to differ from one another? Who makes me different from David Wood? And what hast thou that thou didst not receive? Well, everything I have that's good and pleasing to God is from God. Now, if thou didst receive it, why dost thou glory as if thou hadst not received it? Let me explain that last part. If you know God has anointed me to be a gifted teacher and it wasn't something I deserve, I earn, right, or I gave to myself, how dare I look down upon you or think I'm better than you when God could have easily given you that gift, not me, because I'm no better than you and I don't deserve this gift that he gave me, but that applies to every one of you. Any gift you have that you excel in, God gave it to you. So then why then do you then look down upon someone who may not be gifted in the way you are? Yep, it does, sort of truth. I'll show that to you in a minute. Are you with me, what Paul is, uh, what Paul is saying here by inspiration of the Holy Spirit? You understand what Paul is saying? You are what you are because God gave it to you and made you that. So then why then do you look down upon someone because he's not as gifted as an evangelist as you are, or he's not as a sharp theologian as you are, he's not as a powerful speaker as, as you are, when you are what you are because of his grace, or you wouldn't be it. And you're not better than that person, you don't deserve it. So don't ever be puffed up and look down upon someone else. You understand what Paul is saying? You understand what Paul is saying? Okay. Now, I was asked the question, is faith a gift? Yes. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. To keep it short, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9, it's verse 9. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. Yeah. Exactly, choose Jesus. And thank you, Craig Smith. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 9. Watch here. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man. To profit with all. I'll explain what that means. Shakespearean English. The manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. Now, for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Right? How to instruct people to be wise. To another, the word of knowledge. Right? To know something and have the wisdom to know what to do with it by the same Spirit. 
Now watch here, verse 9. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Now someone mentioned that faith is measured out according to God. Okay, Romans 12, verse 3. Romans 12, verse 3. It will be confirmed in you, Weston, by two or three witnesses. I'll give you an example in a minute. Romans 12, verse 3. For I say, through the grace given unto me to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, according as God had dealt to every man the measure of faith. For Romans 12, 3. Everyone has been given a measure of faith. So every one of you who believe in Jesus Christ, you've been given enough faith to trust in Christ and cling to Christ. But some have been given more faith, which is why you see some people, they're so sold out for Christ. Their faith is so strong. They'll go in the midst of Mecca in front of the Kaaba and preach Jesus and are not afraid. Others are more timid. Right? Because even the measure of faith, the amount of faith you have, has been measured and apportioned to you by the triune God. That's Romans 12, 3. Did you read it? So everyone who is a believer, born of the Spirit, made one with Christ by the Spirit, part of the spiritual body, you all have enough faith to save you. You all have enough faith in Christ, trust in Christ to save you. But some have an abundance of that faith which makes them so bold they can go in the midst of Mecca or Medina or they can go in the midst of China and say Jesus is Lord knowing they'll be gunned down or thrown in prison and they don't care because it's not them. It's the Holy Spirit giving them that kind of faith to be immovable. You see that? You saw that, right? Romans 12 verse 3. So, yes. Hoping that answered your question. Even faith is a gift, and it's a fruit. It's a gift and a fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, so still if you don't believe me, right? Galatians 5, 22. Let's read Galatians 5, 16 to 26, but pay attention. Galatians 5, verse 22, all the way to 25. Galatians 5, 22 to 25. Yes, God can also increase your faith, the faith in you. Increases it. The more you walk with the Spirit, the less you indulge your flesh, the stronger you become, the more faith you have by the grace of God's Spirit working in and through you. Read Galatians 5, 16 and 26. That's one of those mysteries, those paradoxes. The more I walk in obedience to the Spirit, the stronger I become, the more faith I have, the bolder I get, right? And my flesh gets weakened, but even that walk in the Spirit has to be prompted by the grace of the Spirit. See, it's one of those paradoxes, those mysteries. But now, let's read. Galatians 5, 16 to 26. I'm going to start. This I say then, walk in the Spirit. Walk in obedience to the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit, not to your flesh. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Right? For the flesh lusteth, the flesh desires to go against the Spirit. That's the goal of the flesh. To go against the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that's in you. To war with the Holy Spirit. To make you disobey the Holy Spirit. That's the goal of your flesh. And the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that ye, ye would. But if ye be led by the Spirit. Submit to the Spirit. Seek the Spirit. Ask the Spirit to fill you. Obey the Spirit. Right? So if you're led by the Spirit. You're not under the law. Meaning the law is not your judge anymore. Because you're not trying to justify yourself by keeping the law. You're now born of the Spirit, kept by the Spirit, sealed by the Spirit, walking in union with the Spirit. And that Spirit was given to you, not because of your obedience to the law, but because of your faith in Jesus. Out of His grace, He gave you the Holy Spirit when you trusted in Him. That's what it's saying here. Okay, let's continue reading. Okay. For the flesh lusteth, okay, now let's go to 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now 19, now the works of the flesh are manifest. They're clear as day what the works of the flesh are, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, this word, man, it's hard on my tongue, hedonism, a hedonistic lifestyle, a party lifestyle, party, drinking, gorging yourself, committing sexual orgies, right? 
Idolatry. Hold on, let me go there. Let me scroll back, sorry. Witchcraft. These are all the works of the flesh. Hatred without a cause. Variance, being divided, causing division. That's of the flesh, of the devil, of the flesh. Emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, causing an uprising, right? Heresies, contrary opinions to the truth that God has revealed. Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, partying, right? right? And such like, of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now notice the fruit of the Spirit. What is the fruit of the Spirit? Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit, if you're walking in the Spirit and you're filled with the Spirit and you're born of the Spirit, here's the fruit showing you belong to the Spirit. Here is the evidence, the proof that you are a tree made alive, planted by God, that you're rooted in the living waters, the Holy Spirit. Here's the proof. Love. Joy, peace, long-suffering, meaning being patient. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meaning being faithful. Trusting in Jesus and being faithful to Jesus. Meekness, temperance, controlling your temper. Against such there is no law. Now 24 to 20, 26. 24, 26. Now these have to be cult cultivated. These have to be developed. These have to be perfected in you. Right. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Right. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with affections and lusts. We have crucified our flesh and its lust. And then 25. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory. Let us not look for fame and attention. Right. And fortune. But provoking one another. Envying one another. Let's not do that. Let's not look for fame and attention. Let's not provoke one another to sin, cause one another to hate, cause one another to fight, bring division. Let's not do that. That's of the flesh, but we're of the spirit. But you saw Galatians 5.22? Post Galatians 5.22. No, he's a Syrian, I believe. I don't know why he would do G-D, Niles guy. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. There you go. There you go. Is it clear as day now? So, I hope that answered that question. I just wanted to get that out of the way. You need to be thankful for everything. Everything, right? Be thankful for the clothes that you have. Be thankful how accessible food and medicine has become. Over 100 years ago, how many supermarkets were there, groceries were there that you can run to even two in the morning to get what you need if you run out. Even that's a blessing. It's a blessing to have a 24-hour Walmart that you take for granted of. You know, granted, you take for granted, take advantage of. It's a blessing to have 24-hour pharmacies. You see my point? 100 years ago, this was unheard of. Even in the 70s, when I was a young little, you know, troublemaker, there were stores that were not open on Sundays. Did you know that in the 70s? You would be very hard-pressed to find a store that was open on Sunday. Emulation is to emulate, imitate evil. Look up to people who are evil to mislead you or even to turn people into idols, right? How many of you can remember... That stores were closed on Sunday, on Sundays. How many of you can remember that? Okay. How many of you can tell me of a store that is closed on Sunday right now? Before, it would be shocked to hear a store open on Sunday. We'd be shocked. Hey, man, that store is open on Sunday. Really? Let's go. Right now, you'll be shocked to hear if there's a store closed on Sunday. Right? Right now, you'll be shocked to hear there are stores closed on Sunday. Whereas in the 70s, we were shocked to know there were stores open on Sunday. Yeah. Right? Okay. 
We are such spoiled brats that even these things, because they're common, things we, we enjoy and benefit from every day, that we forget just less than 50 years ago, the people 50 years ago didn't have the luxury of running to a 24-hour supermarket or a drugstore. We are so spoiled and so selfish and feel so entitled that we don't even thank God for these benefits. So that someone can mock me and say, praying for the internet connection buffering. What a waste of prayer. Is everyone clear there? Now, trusting the Holy Spirit to fill us and fill me and protect me from error and guide me to answer questions in Jesus' name. I was asked two questions yesterday. I don't know if the people asked me the questions were here. One was Mark 13, 32. I was asked about Mark 13, 32, that the son doesn't know the day, day and hour. And by implication, neither does the Holy Spirit. That was the second question. I think that was it. There were three questions. I answered two of them. I think so. But anyway, let me let me field the questions. Mark 13, 32. If you guys want me to answer, I will. Let me see. He asked me that yesterday, the same Patrick that gave me a hard time today. Oh, my goodness. See, that, that actually proves my point. The man is not sincere. Okay, do you guys want me to answer Mark 13, 32? Of the day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the sun. And does that include the Holy Spirit as well? You guys want me to answer that? How many ones? Of the day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the sun. And does that include the Holy Spirit? Okay, so if you guys put one, let's answer that. And I'll try to take more questions. But guys, if you really want me to do justice to Mark 13, 32, if you really want... This guy always comes to my channel, this Ethiopian brother, and he asks me the same question. Isaiah 7, 14, chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, saying that they say it's already fulfilled. Brother, if you ask me that question again, even though I've seen it for now the millionth time, I swear I'm going to hang myself with my shoestrings. And right here, just to show you, just to show you I'm not lying, here, here. Okay, brother, here. You see this? You see this door right here, this patio? You see this patio? You see it's a window, right? It's a window. I swear, if you ask me it one more time, I will lunge head first through this patio window, and either it's going to bust my head or I'm going to bust the window, one of the two. So ask me it again. I, right now, look, look. I'm about to look, look. Go ahead, ask me. I'm about. It's not my home, CJ. It's not my home. I, I'm going to be living in a dinghy apartment, God willing, with your prayers. And with the love and support of brothers, I'll be moving to a two-bedroom apartment February 15, trusting God to provide. Because my goal in the long run is to have my daughters with me so I can put them to sleep and wake up with them because I miss them. Right? So pray for me. Okay. So ask me that question about Isaiah 7. Right now, you will see. I'll be gone in a nanosecond, and you're going to hear a big thump. Boom! I'm going to throw myself out that patio window. And when my brother falls, finds me unconscious on the floor, perhaps in a coma, comatose state, I'm going to make sure I leave a letter. I'm going to say, watch the YouTube session at this time, stamp mark, and find the guy who kept mentioning Isaiah 7 and hunt him down and get him arrested for murder. Okay? Are you guys ready now? Are we ready for Mark 3? Mark 13, 32. Brother, be patient. I will do a session on Isaiah 7, 14. Well, that's my brother's house, so pray for him. He's allowed me to stay here out of the goodness of his heart. From October 18, I've been here, you know, and that's why I have to find my own place because I can't be a burden on him. He's got his own responsibility, so praise the Lord Jesus. So it's, this is his home. He's been living here since, I think, the late 90s. I'm going to be moving out February 15th, so pray. And guys... This is a huge step for me. This is going to be the first time in my life where I go and find my own place and live on my own. Up until the time I got married, I used to live with my mom to take care of her. My mom got old, and I used to take care of her, so I never lived apart from my mom until I got married. And my older brother came and took over the responsibility until Jesus took my mother home. And then I lived with my ex-wife for almost nine years. With my children, this will be probably, yeah, it is. It's the first time in my life I had to go get my own place 
and live alone. And it's not easy. These changes in life are not easy. They never are. But we endure by the power of the Holy Spirit. We endure by the grace of Jesus. We endure because of the love of Jesus. I don't know how much I can love it, Marion, when I don't have my children. You know, it's hard. It's hard not having my kids, but that's okay. If only I can let them know. And I pray God will use these YouTube sessions that when they come and watch them, and I pray the Spirit will stir them up to watch them because they know their Baba has a YouTube channel. They know he has a YouTube channel. I pray that they listen and they hear their Baba's heart. They hear how much their Baba is in love with them. And that after Jesus, first is Jesus, that they may know I love Jesus more than anything, though I love him imperfectly. And I can never love them the way I love Jesus. I love Jesus more than them. But after Jesus on earth, they are my heart and I will die for them. They are nine and seven. They're nine years, nine and seven, a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. Nine years old, the oldest, Hebrews 1, 8, and the youngest one is seven. Right? I miss them so much. Sorry, guys. I just, you know, lost in thought thinking of them. Pray for me. It's not easy. Anyway. Anyway, it's good. May the Lord Jesus bless them and love them as only he can. And heal them and seal them. If I have found favor in the sight of my Lord Jesus, if he has counted me among his servants, may he love my children and bless my children. May he provide for them over abundantly. May I die before anything happens to them. And may they grow up to be warriors of Jesus Christ. If I have found favor in your sight, Lord Jesus. If you have counted me among your servants, even though I fail you and I love you imperfectly, Love my daughters as only you can and bless them and fill them with all your goodness, Lord Jesus. And remind them that their Baba on earth aches for them. I love you, Lord Jesus. I love you. In Jesus' name. All right. With that said. Okay, let's let's go to Mark 13, 32. Let's let's unpack Mark 13, 32. Mark 13, 32. Let's look at that. So you want me to deal with it? Let's deal with it. Mark 13, 32. Now, if you want me to do justice to this passage, yeah, isn't it the best, Terp, the honeymooners? I love the honeymooners. It's the best comedy. Clean. To the moon, Alice. Bang, zoom. None. All right, there. All right, Mark 13, 32. Jesus. Okay, if you want me to do justice, Mark 13, 32, I'm going to have to take some time to unpack this. So what I'm going to do, if you want, this entire week, I'll do live Q&A. What do you think? Live Q&A for this entire week so I can take as many questions because this is going to take at least an hour to unpack. All right, Mark 13, 32. But of the day and that hour knoweth no man, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Okay. Number one, let me deal in Jesus' name, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name, Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name, cover us by the blood of Jesus, beatify me, Lord, for your glory and make us holy. I'm going to give you the article that goes with this session. Remind me to give you the article that goes with this session. Okay, I wrote an article. Let me deal with the fact, does this mean that even the Holy Spirit doesn't know? Absolutely not. Let's reread carefully what Jesus says. Because you have some anti-Trinitarians that are so desperate, they try to include the Holy Spirit in this discussion. Let's see, even the Holy Spirit doesn't know. Let's reread it to see that's not the case at all. Okay, let's reread it. Mark 13, 32. One more time. I don't know what happened to Protestant. Did he get left behind? Are we raptured? Okay. Let's pay attention. But of the day and that hour knoweth no man. No, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Here again, the King James has an advantage over other translations because it translates the Greek as knoweth no man. Knoweth no man. Now the word man is not in the Greek. The word man is anthropos. The Greek says no one knows. But the King James translators understood from the context Jesus was referring to humans, so it made explicit what's implicit. What do I mean? Let's compare Mark 13, 32 in another translation. 
Let's read NIV or any other translation. ESV, Mark 13, 32. Uj, if you be patient, I'll explain to you what Jesus is doing. I know you're excited, but you be patient, brother. Okay, let's look at another translation. Show you why the King James perfectly captures the point here. But concerning the day of our the day or hour, no one knows. No one knows. You see, it's different from the King James, right? King James says no man. But this one says no one. Because in the Greek, the word man is not there. The word man is anthropos. It also, there's another Greek word, it's used for male. An ear. It's not, it doesn't appear in the Greek. It does literally say no one. No one. Are you with me there? No one. So why did the King James translators render the Greek as no man? Why did the King James translators render the Greek as no man? Because of the context. Now, here's where I really need you to give me your undivided attention and trust the Holy Spirit to illuminate us. Because here's where you're going to learn how to interpret words in their context. How to interpret phrases, sentences in their context. Though the Greek says no one knows, it's clear that Jesus is not referring to everyone. He's referring to a particular group. How do I know that? If Jesus meant no one in the sense that every single creature, then he wouldn't need to go on and mention angels. He wouldn't need to say no one knows, neither the angels nor the sun, because they'd all be included in that category of no one, right? If no one meant to include every creature or everyone with the exception of God, there's no need to go on and say no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the sun. The fact that he goes on to mention neither the angels of heaven nor the sun shows by no one, he means no human being. So the King James translators got it right. Glory to the triune God. No one meaning no human knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the son, but the father. So right off the bat, Jesus is not including the Holy Spirit. He's saying among humans, there's no human being who knows. Among the angels of heaven, there's no angel who knows. Not even the Son, but the Father. But the Holy Spirit is not human, and he's not an angel, nor is he the Son. So he's not included in that group. So number one, Jesus is not including the Holy Spirit. So this statement cannot be interpreted to include the Holy Spirit. No, he's talking about three groups. No human, neither the angels, nor the Son. That's it. They don't know. The Holy Spirit doesn't fit in any one of those categories. Because the Spirit is not the Son. The Spirit is not an angelic creature. It's not a human being. So that's number one. Number two, we are quite clearly, explicitly told the Holy Spirit is omniscient. He knows everything because he knows the mind of God and he knows all the thoughts of God. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 10 to 12. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. I said, I'm going to go deep. We're going to unpack the meat. I hope you're blessed. I hope you enjoy it. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 10 to 12. Okay, let's follow. Follow me. Here you're going to get blown away about the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 12. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. Pay attention here. God hath revealed this to us. Uh, the, but God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. Underline that or highlight it. The spirit searcheth all things. Yea, the deep things of God. I'll come back to that in a minute. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. Now let me explain what Paul is saying. Only the Spirit knows the mind of God, is able to plumb and search the depth of God's thoughts, even though God's thoughts are infinite and His mind is infinite. The Spirit searches, plums the depth of the infinite mind and the infinite thoughts of God. So who better than the Spirit to reveal to us the things of God? Are you with me there? Did you get it? 
If the Holy Spirit knows the thoughts of God and knows the mind of God and is able to plumb the depth of God's mind, knows all his infinite thoughts and mind, who better than the Spirit, who's more qualified than the Spirit to make God's thoughts known to us? No one. There's no one more qualified. However, for the Spirit to know the mind of God, for the Spirit to search and plumb the depths of God's mind and his thoughts, he has to be omniscient because Paul clearly says there is no creature who has been able to search the depth of God's mind. Romans 11, 33. Romans 11, 33. Guys, Hafsan, all you guys, focus on the topic. Why are you talking about Muhammad? Romans 11, 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Wait, if... The judgments of God and the paths of God are unsearchable, past finding out, and no one can know the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How then can Paul say in 1 Corinthians 2.10, the Spirit knows and searches the deep things of God. He just said, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, they're unsearchable, past finding out. You read it right there, Romans 11, 33, right? Now compare that again to 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10. Compare it again. Watch it. And ask me to give you the links to the articles before I end the session. But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Well, if the Spirit is a creature... Impossible, according to Romans 11, 33. The Spirit, if he's a creature, cannot search all things, the deep things of God, because a creature is incapable of doing that. But the Spirit can. Right? Is that making sense? Now let's go to Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14. The omniscience of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14. Isaiah 40, verses 13 and 14. Who hath directed the spirit of Jehovah? Notice it's about the spirit. Pay attention, guys. Pay attention, please. Don't be distracted. Focus. Who hath directed the spirit of Jehovah, meaning instructed him, or being his counselor hath taught him? The answer is no one has directed the spirit or taught the spirit. With whom did he take counsel? Nobody. Who instructed him? No one can instruct him. And taught him in the path of judgment. And taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding. These are rhetorical questions. The answer is no one has taught the spirit, instructed the spirit, guided the spirit, directed the spirit. Because the spirit is omniscient. He needs no teacher. You got it? Is that, did that sink in? The Spirit is omniscient. He doesn't need you to teach Him, guide Him, instruct Him, or show Him what judgment is. And He knows it all. He teaches you. You don't teach Him. Okay, now Romans 8, 26 to 27. Romans 8, 26 to 27. Hope it's sinking in and you're learning a little more about the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 26 to 27. Watch here. Pay attention. It's where I need you to really focus. This is because this is now a core doctrine of the faith. The Godhead, the nature of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. It's not a secondary issue. Romans 8, 26, 27. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, helps us in our weaknesses. For we know not what we should pray. We don't know what to pray, how to pray, what to pray for in the time of our weaknesses. But we're not alone. Because though we know not how we should pray, as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now watch here. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit. Oh, wow. God who searched the hearts knows the mind of the Spirit as the Spirit knows the thoughts of God. So the Spirit has a mind and God knows it. 
And God's thoughts are perfectly known by the Spirit. So God knows the mind of the Spirit. And the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You don't get more Trinitarian than this. God knows the mind of the Spirit. The Spirit knows the deep things of God, the thoughts of God. And because the Spirit knows God's thoughts perfectly, he knows God's will for the believer perfectly. So he knows how to pray for a believer in accord with God's will for that believer. So God knows the mind of the Spirit, showing the Spirit is a person, as a divine mind. And the Spirit, because he knows the thoughts of God, all the things of God, the deep things of God, he knows perfectly what God's will is for that person in that situation and knows how to pray then in accord with God's will for that person in that situation. You get it? Is it sinking in? Is Marcy here or Marie? Marie Lynn? Who would have thunk it? The spirit has a mind. So he's a person, not a flesh and blood person, a divine person. And God, who searches hearts, knows the mind of his spirit, as the spirit knows his mind and his thoughts. Distinct persons who know each other perfectly. The same reason why Muhammad died like a filthy dog, because he was poisoned. Okay, You with me there? Did it sink in? Do you now see the Holy Spirit is omniscient? He knows everything. And he knows all the thoughts of God. He knows the mind of God. And he himself has a mind that God knows. That's why in Mark 13, 32, Mark 13, 32, the Holy Spirit is not included in that list. Because Jesus is referring to humans, angels, the Son, not everything in existence with the exception of God. He's saying no human knows, no angel knows, nor the Son. So where do you get that Mark 13, 32 is referring to the Holy Spirit? Mark 13, 32 is referring to the Holy Spirit. Where do you get in that list a reference to the Holy Spirit not knowing the dare hour? In fact, can I ask you a question? Let's look at 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11 one more time. One more time. I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you guys a serious question. Okay, Mark 13, 32, 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11. Watch this. 1 Corinthians 2, 10 to 11. Watch here. But God hath revealed them unto us by his spirit. For the spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Now notice, for what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him. Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the spirit of God. Let me ask you a question. Is the dare hour one of the things of God? Is the knowledge of the dare hour one of the things of God? Right? It's one of the thoughts of God, one of the things of God, the knowledge of the hour. But hold on, folks. You just read in 1 Corinthians 2.11, the Spirit knows the things of God. If the Spirit knows the things of God, and one of the things of God is knowledge of the dare hour, how are you going to argue the Spirit doesn't know the dare hour? You understand my question? One of the things of God is the knowledge of the dare hour. The Holy Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God, and knows the things of God. Well, the knowledge of the hour is one of the things of God, and the Holy Spirit knows everything of God. So how can he not know the dare hour? How can he not know the dare hour? Is that clear? Is it clear? Jojo, don't let love, love distract you. There, this is one of those distractions. We're trying to focus on the topic, but he's going into a tangent. So the two points, let me establish the two points. Number one, Mark 13, 32, nowhere includes the Holy Spirit. That's point number one. Who told you Jesus is including the Holy Spirit? That's number one. Number two, positively speaking, the New Testament and the Old Testament confirm the Holy Spirit is omniscient. The Holy Spirit possesses infinite wisdom. 
The Holy Spirit knows all things, searches the deep things of God, knows the things of God, and the Holy Spirit has a mind that God knows. What else do you want from the Bible to affirm that the Holy Spirit is a divine person with a divine mind who's omniscient, who knows all things that God knows, and he knows all the things of God, and God knows the mind of the Spirit? You need any more evidence? Is that can I move now to the other point? I just want to make sure this was clear. Is this clear? Okay. Now let's talk about the sun not knowing. If that was clear, no one's confused. We can talk about the sun not knowing. See, Elizabeth Tudor is not patient. Elizabeth, if you're patient, we'll get there. Saved by grace, I would say nothing to the Roman Catholic because that's not my topic. And bring up an irrelevant issue, you're going to have to say bye-bye. No respect for the session. I'm talking about one thing, they want to go into another thing. You're going to ask a question before I finish this point, Kevin? Okay. So if you guys are ready, those who are actually paying attention, not here for their own agenda, you told me to answer this question. I haven't finished answering question. Now they want to ask other questions. I don't get it. It's okay. Brr, brr, brr. Beep, 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 beep. I'm gonna buy okay. Here goes, guys. Here goes the window. There it goes. All right. All right. Michael Panorius. You know, I love you, brother. Michael, this is for you. I love you. Can you stop with the commentary on my comments? Can you sit here and just listen and stop chiming in? Because you're gonna have to prove that the son restricted his knowledge, not just asserted. Brother, if I need your help, I'll ask you. In fact, here, I'll give you my number. And you can call me and call me collect and I'll accept the charges as long as you call me 1-800-COLLECT and save me a buck or two. I've noticed for some reason you're in love with yourself and you got to keep commenting on my comments. Do you want to co write a commentary on Sam Shamoon's commentary? Because I know a publisher. Maybe you can write a contract. I want to write the definitive commentary on Sam Shamoon's commentary of the Bible. I'll comment on his comment. Michael Panorius, you're ignoring me, right? Huh? This guy's going to have a short lifespan here on my channel, right? Yes. Okay, let's go. Thank you, Dreda. You can still listen to me while you're going to work. Mark 13, 32. Let's read that one more time with Matthew 24, 36. Huh? It's not that I can't be taught. It's very disrespectful as I'm trying to answer, and this guy's chiming in, and he's been doing it for the past couple of days. I know his intention as well. He means well. I just hope he doesn't have a picture of me and burns incense to my picture. I don't mind if he has a picture of David Wood and lights candles to his picture. That's between him and David Wood. Protestant, which part of Mark 13, 32 wasn't clear? Why is it the second time you gave me 22? Protestant, what's going on with you? You've been dropping the ball. Are you suffering from Alzheimer's disease, dude? Darn it. Mark 13, 32 and Matthew 24, 36. Mark 13, 32 and Matthew 24, 36. Those bonus verses, man. But he's been giving me too many bonus verses, man. I'm like scared. What's going on? Is it my lisp? Mark 13, 32. The brother, he told me. All right. Mark 13, 32. Matthew 24, 36. Okay. Read with me the parallel to this passage. Mark 13, 32. But of the day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. But of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Now, you notice you find the par the, the, ter the terrible. Say, Christian, I want to say parable because I saw terrible. And if, if ugly was a sin, you'd be the greatest sinner mankind has ever known. Anyway, notice the parallel, not parable or terrible, as the Lord Jesus loosens my tongue and guides me by his spirit. Notice that Matthew and Mark report the saying of Jesus. Okay. If someone quotes Matthew 24, 36, this is how you respond. If they quote Matthew 24, 36, are you ready? It depends which gospel they quote. Because here, let me give you some rules. Number one, rule number one, try to prove your position by using the very book or the author 
that your opponent is using against you. So if your opponent quotes Paul, stick with Paul. Don't run to John to explain Paul. You with me there? You with me there? So if they're quoting Mark, try to use Mark if you can to prove your point. That's why I first said the Holy Spirit is nowhere included in that list. Then I went to Paul. Notice what I did. You got to pay attention because you got to learn how to present your case by the grace of God's spirit. Pay attention to this. Okay, pay attention. Before I went to Paul, I showed my case from Mark 13, 32. Who told you the Holy Spirit is included? There is no mention of the Holy Spirit. He's mentioning human beings, angels, and the Son. No reference to the Spirit. That's why I said point number one. See? First prove that Mark 13, 32 is not including the Holy Spirit. Then you go elsewhere to see what the Bible says about the Holy Spirit. So you see what I did? You guys are paying attention because I'm trying to help you be the best you can by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. You see what I did? Okay. So now, if someone quotes Mark 13, 32, try to prove your case from Mark 13, 32. Try to prove your case from the Gospel of Mark. Sometimes they're going to quote Matthew 24, 36. If they do, they make it easier for you. They make my job easier if they quote Matthew. Do you know why? Okay, you know why? Matthew 24, 36. Let me show you why. Because of Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Okay, now, if they quote Matthew 24, 36, then I'm going to say, oh, thank you. You just made my day. Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, which is not quoted by Mark, by the way. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27. Okay, read. All things are delivered unto me of my Father, and no man knoweth the Son but the Father, Neither knoweth any man the Father, save the Son, and to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. This should blow you away. This is also found in Luke 10, 22. Matthew eleven twenty seven 27 is quoted in Luke 10, 22. Now, let me unpack this. Now, here's where I need you to focus by the power of the Holy Spirit. Focus. Focus. Jesus says, no one knows the Son except the Father. And no one knows the Father except the Son. Right there, you should be blown away. Because Jesus is saying his knowledge of the Father is reciprocal. The way the Father knows him, he knows the Father. And he says, no one is qualified and no one can know me except the Father. Who does Jesus think he is? He's saying, no one, no man, nobody is able to know me, the Son. Only my Father has that ability and capacity. Why? Who do you think you are? Only someone who's incomprehensible by nature is beyond the ability of another to know. Which why only God can know you, the Father know you, because the Father has a divine mind and he can comprehend the incomprehensible. You see what he just said? No one knows the Son except the Father. Wait, what do you think you are that only the Father can know you? Let me, let me repeat so it can sink in. Who do you think you are that only the Father has the capacity and ability to know you? Are you implying that it requires a divine mind to comprehend you? Yeah. Only one with a divine mind who can comprehend the incomprehensible can comprehend me. But then it's reciprocal because the son knows the father the way the father knows the son. Because notice it says no one knows the son except the father and no one knows the father except the son and to whom I, the son, want to reveal him. Wait, wait, wait. So Jesus, you're saying, you're saying, you know the Father to the same degree the Father knows you? Yeah. But hold on. The Father knows you inside and out. He knows you perfectly. He knows every thought you've had, you have, and will have. And you're saying you know the Father in that same way? Exactly. Which is why I alone am qualified to make him known. You got it? You understand that statement? You understand how mind-blowing of a statement that is? I know the Father in the same way that the Father knows me. But Jesus, the Father knows you inside and out. He knows all the thoughts you've had, all the thoughts you currently have, and all the thoughts you will have. He even knows the word 
that will come out of your mouth before it comes out, but you're saying you know him in that same way? Did it sink in or no, the implication of that? Since the Father is incomprehensible, since the Father is beyond comprehension, beyond understanding, unsearchable, who does Jesus think he, at, he is to claim to know the Father to the same extent and to the same degree that the Father knows him? Thank you for quoting one of my papers. Knows him exhaustively. So do you not see in this passage Jesus claiming to be omniscient? Because it requires an omniscient mind to know the Father truly as he is and to know the Father inside and out. And do you not see that Jesus is also claiming to be incomprehensible, which is why only the Father can know him, know him because it requires a divine mind to know the incomprehensible Son, and the Father has such a mind. Are you with me there? Is it sinking in or no? Before I move on, I can't move on if it's not sinking in. So notice in Matthew 11, long before Matthew 24, Jesus has already claimed to be the omniscient, incomprehensible son who's equal to the father in knowledge and in wisdom and understanding. That's in Matthew 11. That comes before Matthew 24. Oh, wow. So already in Matthew 11, long before Matthew 24, Jesus has claimed to be the incomprehensible, omniscient son who knows the Father to the same degree, to the same extent that the Father knows him, and therefore he's equal to the Father in understanding, in wisdom, and knowledge. <whistles> right? So now let me ask you a question. If the Father knows the Son in the same way that the Son knows him, if the Son knows the Father to the same degree and to the same extent that the Father knows him, Here's a question for every one of you. Here's a question for every one of you. Does the Father know all the thoughts of the Son? <clears throat> Come on, Karen. Give it up, sister. So he knows the Father, but not his thinking. So you mean the Father knows the Son, but he doesn't know the Son's thinking. Come on, sister. Don't kill me like that. Please. All right. So the Father knows all the thoughts of the Son. If it's not reciprocal, does the Son know all the thoughts of the Father? According to Matthew eleven twenty seven, send Muhammad to smooch the black stone like a filthy pagan he is, like his prophet Muhammad. So, the the father knows all the thoughts of the son. Since the son knows the father the way the father knows him, does the son know all the thoughts of the father? Are you with me there? Okay, you're saying yes. Is one of the thoughts of the Father the knowledge of the day and hour? Is that one of the thoughts in, in the Father's mind? So that's not a thought in his mind. Yes, right? So if the Father knows all the thoughts of the Son, and the Son knows the Father the same way the Father knows him, then the Son knows all the thoughts of the Father, then the Son knows the day or hour. But then we're confronted with Matthew 24, 36. But then we're confronted with Matthew 24, 36. Notice what came first, Matthew 11, right? So Matthew 11 is preparing you how to interpret Matthew 24 and how not to interpret it. Uh, Dread, I'm going to embarrass you with John 15, 15, because again, you're chiming in when you should be shutting up. How dare you quote John when John 16, 30, 31 says that Jesus knows all things. And John 21, 17. If you ever pontificate and quote John 15, 15 out of context and ignore what I'm trying to say, I'm going to embarrass you because this calls for someone to be embarrassed for being stupid enough to quote John 15, 15 and then forgetting to quote the next chapter, John 16, 29 and 31, where the disciples say, now we know that you know all things and need no one to question you. No, bro. He knows all things. 
John 21, 17 as well. How dare you go to John to try to refute me? Get this guy out of here. Don't ever come back. Get out of here. Don't ever come back. This is what happens for those of you who are not patient and let me finish the answer. This is what's going to happen to you guys. Because too many chiefs want to impress me with their knowledge. They're going to get banned because that means you're not listening. You're not listening. I'm trying to help you. I'm not your enemy. You understand I'm trying to help you? I'm trying to help you be the best you can by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit using me to do that. Why do you guys got to chime in and comment and not wait? Don't ever go to John to try to prove something contrary. Okay, And I just got done saying, prove your case from that particular writer. What did this guy do? He went to John. But we're in Matthew. We love you, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Okay, now, is it clear in Matthew 11, 27, that the Son knows the Father to the same extent that the Father knows the Son? Is that clear, apart from these satanic distractions? Right? So, does the Father know every thought of the Son? Does the Father know every thought of the Son? Okay, if that's yes... Then if the Father knows the Son, the same way the Son knows the Father, the Son knows the Father, the same way know, the Father knows the Son, and the Father knows all the thoughts of the Son, that means the Son knows all the thoughts of the Father. That means the Son knows that thought the Father has of the day and hour. So by the time you get to Matthew 24, Matthew wants you to keep in mind Matthew eleven twenty seven. Matthew eleven twenty seven. He's already told you Christ is the incomprehensible, omniscient Son. So then in Matthew 24, 36, what's going on? Matthew 24, 36. And I'm going to have to go back to Mark. But let's go to Matthew 24, 36. What's going on here? Matthew, what are you doing? You just established Christ is the incomprehensible, omniscient son. Yeah, I did that. What are you doing in Matthew 24, 36? Why are you now throwing a monkey wrench? I'll get there, Turp. If you guys are patient, you guys are not patient, see? You, you understand patience, which I don't have, is a fruit of the Spirit, and I'm asking for that fruit in me and in you? You guys want me to just answer 10 seconds? Okay, here, let me give you the answer. He's a servant. End of session. Let's go, guys. That's it. I'm done, because you guys don't want to wait. Here, let me give you the quick answer. Because he's a human servant, he doesn't know everything. All right, let's now change the sub subject. All right, here goes Hater Wood, hating. Man, you make Hater Wood look like he's a saint with all these spiritual virtues. That's how bad you guys are. You're so bad, you make this guy look like he's a holy servant. Okay. Anyway, I'm, I'm going to give you the short answer. We're going to go to another question, okay, guys? Because you guys are not patient. You don't want me to unpack this. You just want me to give you the short answer. Okay, you got your answer. He's a human servant. What's the next question, guys? Let's go to the next question. Let's go to the next question. No, no, you can thank Turb because Turb wants a quick answer. He's a human servant, and as a man, he doesn't know. So let's go to the next question. Any other questions? No, because I kept telling you guys, be patient. You're not patient. I, I can't. I can't, you know. Okay, go ahead, Sai Christian. Let's go to another topic. I'm going to change questions now. Okay, what's your question, Christian? Uh, Sai Christian. I'm waiting for Sai Christian. Go ahead, Sai Christian, because these guys are not patient. They want to chime in, keep talking. You know, that's all right. We're going to change. I gave you the. I gave you. The answer. He's a human servant, doesn't know anything. That's right, Acts 17, baby. I learned from the best. Pamela Wilton, if you find Luke chapter 39, I'll be in shock. Was that part of the Dead Sea Scrolls findings? What if a Muslim says Jesus didn't know there? Okay, what about it, Sai Christian? What if a Muslim says Jesus doesn't know the day hour? 
I don't get it. What's the question, Sai Christian? Khliqot. Amen. Thank you, Anthony Davis. God bless you too. Okay, Sarita, God bless you too, sister. I don't know what this guy's saying. Yeah. Okay, good. Sai, can you answer the question before the rapture, Sahi? I know you're a Syrian and you take your sweet time. What's your question, Sai Christian? Allahu Akbar. My goodness. This guy wants to get blocked too. My goodness. All right. Okay, this guy's not answering. He doesn't know what the father knows. Okay, so I see some, how much Sahih Christian loves you guys. Sahih Christian is asking the same question because he wants the long version. So he wants me to finish and give you the long version. Okay. Are you guys going to learn to be patient, honestly? Are you guys really going to learn to be patient? Are you guys going to stop chiming in? pontificating or asking questions before I finish. I mean, it's for your benefit, honestly. Look, guys, I really want to take as much time and invest as much time in you. L listen to me. I want you to hear this. I want to invest as much time as I can in your lives for the glory of Jesus so that the Spirit may be pleased to use me to make you the best soldiers for Jesus Christ. But you got to work with me. You got to work with me, guys. You got to work for, with me. You got to just learn, and I say this respectfully, just shut the heck up. Don't be like David Wood, who when we do a live stream with David Wood, he spends 90% talking and only allows us 10% of the time to even say something, and we feel rushed to say it because he wants to hog the mic. He wants to use my reputation to get more people on his channel and then speak and speak and speak and cure people of insomnia, right? And just we sit there, look pretty for the camera because he knows he's ugly as sin and no one's going to keep looking at his ugly mug unless my pretty face is there next to him. Come on, guys. Don't be like David Wood. Shut the heck up. Okay. Okay, now. Let's go back to the point. Let's see who's going to now bring in a question or pontificate before I finish the answer. Okay. Let's see. Let's see if you guys really can control yourselves. We already established from Matthew 11, 27. <laughs> Work for you, huh? you white dictator, you. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, it says, the son knows the father to the same extent that the father knows the son. Let me repeat. Sink in. Sink in. The son knows the father to the same extent that the father knows the son. The father knows the son to the same extent that the son knows the father. Since the Father knows all the thoughts of the Son, if it's reciprocal, then the Son knows all the thoughts of the Father. One of the thoughts of the Father is the knowledge of the day and hour. That means Jesus has to know that thought if he knows the Father in the same way the Father knows him. That's Matthew 11. So Matthew, what are you doing in Matthew 24, 36? Why are you now throwing a monkey wrench in what you've already said in the previous chapters? Let's go to Matthew 24, 36. Matthew 24, verse 36. Let's look at it again. What's up, Lindsay? The greatest of these is love. Lindsay, is that your picture or are you using a picture of someone else to mask your identity? All right, Matthew 24, 36. But, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my father only. What are you doing, Matthew? You just established the son knows all the thoughts of the father like the father knows all the thoughts of the son. You're confusing me here. Not really. There is no confusion to understand Matthew's Christology. But before I unpack that, let's go to Matthew 16, 27. Matthew 16, 27. Watch, watch. If you guys are patient, I'm going to take my time with this. I don't want to rush the answer because I want to give you meat. Okay. Matthew 16, 27. Protestant. Now I know it's Alzheimer's because I said, Matthew 16, 27, you gave me 24, 36. It's definitely Alzheimer's, my friend. We got to pray for you. We love you. All right. 
Just kidding. I love Protestant. I don't care what first last says about Protestant. He's the man. Matthew 16, 27. Guys, pay attention to the text. Matthew 16, 27. Pay attention to the text. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. One more time. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father. So the Son of Man is the Son of God, because God is his Father. And of the angels. And do what? And do what? And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Now, Let's put Matthew 16, 27, and Isaiah 40, verse 10, back to back. Matthew 16, 27, and Isaiah 40, verse 10, back to back. Watch here. Watch what happens. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he, the Son of Man, the Son of God, God is his Father, shall reward every man according to his works. But wait, Isaiah 40, 10 says, Behold the Lord God, Adonai Jehovah. Adonai Jehovah in the, in the Hebrew. Adonai Yehovah will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Wait, 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 wait. Isaiah, who's coming with his reward to repay people? Adonai Yehovah, the sovereign Jehovah. Matthew, who's coming with his reward to repay people? The son of man who's the son of God. Matthew, how do you have Jesus coming to reward people when Isaiah says Jehovah's coming? So who's coming, Isaiah? Jehovah. Who's coming, Matthew? The son of man who's the son of God. Who's going to reward people, Isaiah? Jehovah. Who's coming to reward people, Matthew? The Son of Man who's the Son of God. But Matthew, Old Testament says Jehovah. Yeah, I know. Who do you think the Son of Man is, stupid? Oh, the Son of Man who's the Son of God. That's the Jehovah of the Old Testament who's coming? Yeah, dummy. Don't you get it? Oh, interesting. You get it now? Okay, but wait. Let's, let's, let's keep playing this. Matthew 16, 27, with Isaiah 62, 11. I'm going to probably do two sessions on this, if you're okay with it. Two sessions on this. I'm going to have to do another session tomorrow, if you guys are okay with it, because I want to go really in-depth on this. Matthew 16, 27, with Isaiah 62, 11. Matthew 16, 27, with Isaiah 62, 11. Because I'm going to go really in-depth. So we can finally get this objection out of the pit, out of the way. Guys, read again with me. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then she, he will he shall reward every man according to his works. So the Son of Man, who's the Son of God, will reward every man according to his works. But notice Isaiah sixty two eleven. Behold, Jehovah Yehovah hath proclaimed unto the end of the world. Say ye to the daughter of Zion, Behold, thy salvation cometh. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. Wait, 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 wait. Jehovah, Israel's salvation is coming with his reward to repay people. Isaiah 40 verse 10 says, Jehovah's coming with his reward to repay people. Matthew says, that son of man, who's that son of God, he's coming with his reward to repay people. I'm not getting this. Wait, maybe you guys can still help me. Psalm 62, 12. Psalm 62, 12. And Matthew 16, 27. Psalm 62, 12 and Matthew 16, 27. Is it sinking in? You see what's happening with the Gospels, what they're doing with Jesus? They're identifying him as that Jehovah of the Old Testament. Psalm 62, 12. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest every man according to his work. So the Lord Adonai renderest every man according to his work. Man, Matthew 16, 27 is really confusing me. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father, with his angels, and then he shall reward every man according to his works. I'm confused, guys. The repeated teaching of the Old Testament is Jehovah is coming. The sovereign Jehovah is coming. Adonai is coming. What is reward to repay everyone? Matthew says Jesus is the Son of Man, who is the Son of God. 
He comes with his reward to repay everyone. But Matthew, I, the Old Testament says that's Jehovah who's coming. You're telling me it's Jesus who's coming. And Matthew looks at you right in the face and says, you still don't get it? Get what? That Jesus is that Jehovah of the Old Testament who's coming? Really? No, fakely. Oh. Oh. Hmm. Oh, wait. Psalm 130, 7 to 8. Psalm 130, verses 7 to 8. Okay, watch here. We're still not done. Psalm 130, 7 to 8. Watch here. Let Israel hope in Jehovah, the Lord. For with Jehovah there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Notice verse 8. And he shall redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Guys, reread that. With Jehovah is plenteous, plentiful redemption. Let Israel hope in Jehovah. Because Jehovah is merciful, and he has plentiful redemption. And Jehovah shall redeem Israel from all of Israel's iniquities. Jehovah does that, right? Matthew 1, 21. Notice I'm proving my case just with Matthew. Matthew 1, 21. Matthew 1, 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Wait, wait. Time out, Matthew. One second. Hold on, Matthew. Yeah? Psalm 130 says, Israel is Jehovah's people. Jehovah is the one who saves his people from their iniquities. Of course. I'm not going to contradict that. You said this virgin-born baby, this virgin-born child, born of a virgin by the Spirit, he will save his people from their sins. Absolutely. Matthew, you understand what you're doing? That's Jehovah who does that. And Matthew looks at you and says, you still don't get it? Why do you think he's named Jesus? Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua. Okay, Matthew, I got that. Yeshua is the shortened form of the name Yehoshua. The reason why he's called Yeshua is because of what he does. What does he do? He will save his people from their sins. So what's the connection with the name Yeshua and what he does? Because Yeshua means he is Jehovah who is salvation. So the angel is telling us, name this child Jehovah is salvation. That's what Yeshua means. The shortened form of Yehoshua. Yehoshua is Hebrew for Jehovah's salvation. So name that child Jehovah is salvation because he's the Jehovah who's coming to save his people from their sins. Wait, Matthew. Already in Matthew 1, you're identifying Jesus as Jehovah born as a baby? Jehovah being born as a human baby, as a human child? Yeah. And you already told us in Matthew 11, Jesus is the divine son who's incomprehensible, who has an omniscient mind, who knows God the Father to the same extent that God the Father knows him? Yes. And Jesus is that son of man who's the son of God, who comes to reward people for all they've done, everything that the Old Testament ascribes to Jehovah alone? Yes. So you're going out of your way to show us that Jesus is Jehovah God in the flesh? Yes. And then now you want to come and quote Matthew 24, 36 to prove that he's not God. Nice. I'm sure Matthew would have approved. But then what about Matthew 1, 22 to 23? Matthew 1, 22 to 23. Okay. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Now notice Matthew translates Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So the virgin born baby, the virgin born son, he's called Emmanuel because he is God with us. Now let me show you why this is interesting. In the Greek, it doesn't simply say God with us. Here it is. Here's the link to the Greek. Thank God for modern technology. Click on it, and you'll see that it says that the virgin-born child, the virgin-born son, 
meth hemon ho theos. With us is the God. Ho theos. The God, not a God. Wow. The virgin born child, the virgin born son is the God, Ho Theos, or Ha Theos, with us. The God has come to dwell with us, being born as a human baby from a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Now, let me give you further proof that Jesus is. The God of heaven that came to dwell with us. Let's post Matthew 1, 23. Matthew 28, 20, back to back. Matthew 1, 23. And Matthew 28, 20, back to back. Matthew 1, 23 with Matthew 28, 20, back to back. Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son. And they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Now notice how the gospel ends. Jesus speaking. Jesus speaking says, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always. I, Jesus, am with you, will remain with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Matthew ends the gospel. But in the same way that he started it, he started the gospel by saying, Jesus is the virgin born baby who is God with us. And he ends the gospel with the risen, resurrected Lord as being the same God who still remains with us to the end of the world. A bookend. This is known as a bookend and in inclusio. The author will end his writing by reiterating, repeating the point he made at the start of his book. So this is like a bookend. Matthew begins by saying, Jesus is God with us, Hathaos, the God with us. And he ends it by reiterating the fact, Jesus not only came to be with us, he remains with us till the end of the age. Guys, honestly, what more could Matthew have said and done to show you? What more could Matthew have said and done to show you? This Jesus is Jehovah in the flesh, the God-man. Perfectly divine, perfectly human. What more? What more could he have done to show you that? Right, is it sinking in what I'm doing here? If you understand the method of my exegesis, what am I showing you? Before understanding Matthew 24, 30, 36, the last time I checked, Matthew 24 is the 24th chapter. That means there are 23 chapters that precede it. You're telling me we're going to ignore all those 23 chapters and focus on a verse in the middle of the 24th chapter and ignore everything that Matthew has told us in Matthew 1 to 23 to understand properly what he means and doesn't mean in Matthew 24, 36. That's how you interpret Matthew? So let's ignore Matthew 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and 6. 23 chapters where Matthew has gone out of his way to show that Jesus is the God, Jehovah God in the flesh, the God man who does what the Old Testament says only Jehovah does. And let's focus on Matthew 24, 36. And let's ignore everything else. Yeah, I'm convinced Jesus is in God by that method. You see what I just did? You're not just learning what the answer is. By the power of the Holy Spirit, you're learning how not to interpret your Bible and how to interpret your Bible. I'm teaching you the science of biblical interpretation. I'm teaching you how to learn and study your Bible properly. When I say I, not I, but the Holy Spirit using an imperfect vessel like me. Are you getting it now? Is it sinking in? And I'm going to do the same thing with Mark, God willing, tomorrow. There's a part two to this because I got to do Mark tomorrow. I'm going to follow the same pattern and it's going to blow you away. But focus now because I'm still not done. Still not done. See, if you learn how to interpret the Bible, the Bible comes to life 
And it bears witness to itself that it's a living book. It's living, active, dynamic, because it's the living word, the voice of God. And it will speak to your heart and your mind and transform you. You with me there? Sinking in? Just want to make sure it's sinking in. I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. Okay. We're going to have to read the Greek version of Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2. Let me get you the Greek version of Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2. Because at times, Matthew quotes the Greek version of the Old Testament. Let me get it for you, because I want you to see what's going to happen here. Oh, we're not done yet. Hey, we got fun here. Fun. We're going to have fun. Fun, fun, and the daddy looks as deep in the way. Woo! Psalm 8. I want you to go here. Woo! Did you get the Greek version? No, you didn't get the Greek version. Protestant, I'm getting scared for you, bro. I'm about to cry. I said the Greek version, Psalm 8, verse 1 and 2, you gave me the Hebrew. What's going on, Protestant? Can I come and visit you? When they commit you to an Alzheimer's, no, God forbid. May the Lord Jesus keep you perfectly healthy. The Greek version. Here it goes. Click on it. Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to have to post it. I don't think I can, though. In the Greek version, it's Psalm 8, verse 3. The English translation, the Hebrew version, it's Psalm 8, verses 1 and 2. But the Greek version, it's Psalm 8, verse 3 that I'm looking at. Right? They divide it slightly differently. I can't put all of it here. Can someone post it? It's all Greek to me. The English version of the Greek. Here, let me do it. I don't think it's all going to fit. Oh, yeah, it will. Here it goes. This is the Greek translation or the English translation of the Greek version of Psalm 8, verse 2, which in the Greek is Psalm 8, verse 3. Okay. You have to read verses 1 and 2 to see that this is speaking of Jehovah. This is speaking of Jehovah. For the end concerning the wine press is a psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord. In Hebrew, it's O Jehovah, our Lord. How wonderful is thy name in all the earth, for thy magnificence is exalted above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou perfected praise because of thine enemies that thou mightest put down the, en the enemy and avenger. Okay, let's post that again. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, Thou perfected praise because of thine enemies that thou mightest put down the enemy and the avenger. Now, let me go back again. Okay. You see what the English translation of the Greek says? Speaking of Jehovah, you, Jehovah, ordain praise from the mouth of babes and sucklings. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou perfected praise because of your enemies. You embarrassed your enemies and you showed how foolish your enemies are for not acknowledging you by ordaining praise from babes and sucklings. Even babies and infants know enough, have enough intelligence to know that Jehovah is worthy of worship. But you, my enemies, you're so stupid that you oppose me and not worship me. You understand what God is doing here? You understand what God is doing here? He's saying, look, even babes and infants who supposedly don't know any better, Know enough to worship Jehovah, but you, my enemies, you're so stupid that instead of worshiping me, you're opposing me, showing that you're stupider than even children. And the children are smarter than you because even they have enough common sense to worship me. You understand the point? Here it is. You guys understand the point of the psalm? God is saying to his enemies, you are stupid. You're brutish. You're like animals. Instead of praising me, you're opposing me to your destruction. Look, even infants are smarter than you. They know to praise me. You got it? So let me ask you the question. In Psalm 8, the babes and the sucklings are praising who? Who are they praising in Psalm 8? Who are they praising in the psalm? In Psalm 8, the babes are praising who? Jehovah. Yes, Jehovah. All right. Now see what Jesus does with it. Matthew 21, 15 and 16. Now get ready to be blown away. Matthew 21 is before Matthew 24. Matthew 21, verses 15 and 16. Watch, Bill. Pay attention to this. May the Lord bless them. But here's the point, though. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, Jesus did, and the children 
crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David. They were sore displeased. They got angry and said unto him, Hearest thou what they say? Are you hearing what the children are saying to you? Do something about it. And Jesus saith unto him, Yea, have ye never read, Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings, thou hast perfected praise? What? What did you just do, Jesus? What did you just do, Jesus, if you guys are paying attention? You quoted Psalm 8, the Greek version, to justify children praising you in front of your enemies? Jesus, your enemies are angry that children are praising you. How do you silence your enemies? You say, hey, why are you shocked? Haven't you read the psalm? That's what children do. They praise Jehovah when they're in his presence. Yeah, they praise Jehovah. Yeah. But they're praising you, Jesus. Yeah, they're praising me. But the psalm you quoted, Jesus, the babes and sucklings are praising Jehovah. These children are praising you. Yes, that's what they're supposed to do, according to Psalm 8, verse 2. In the Greek, it's Psalm 8, verse 3. What do you mean that's what they're supposed to do, according to Psalm 8, 3? We know that they're supposed to praise Jehovah, but they're praising you. You still don't get it, do you guys? You still don't get it, huh, who I am? You don't recognize who's standing before you? And what's ironic, you're the very enemies, my enemies that Psalm said would be too stupid to know to worship me. That's why the children worship me. You caught what he just did? Who caught it? I don't know if you caught it. Man, I was 170. We dropped. What's going on here? I'm losing people. You understand what he did? Notice the context of Matthew 21. The enemies of Jesus, instead of worshiping him, they hate him. They want to get rid of him. Children recognize Jesus and praise him in fulfillment of Psalm 8. Psalm 8 says, you will ordain praise from children, from babes and sucklings, and to silence your enemies, to show, look, you're so stupid, you don't realize who's standing in front of you, but they get it. They know who I am. Who are you, Jesus? I am Jehovah is salvation. I am Emmanuel, the God who has come to dwell with you. Wow. Did everyone get it? Who does Jesus think he is? To quote a psalm about infants and babes praising Jehovah to justify the children praising him. And you're telling me the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, do not identify Jesus as Jehovah God in the flesh. <whistles> Folks, are you seeing what Matthew has done before you got to Matthew 24? From chapter 1 all the way to 24, He's gone out of his way to identify Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, ascribing to Jesus the worship that the Old Testament ascribes to Jehovah, the works that the Old Testament ascribes to Jehovah. And at the same time, he's identified Jesus as the Son of God. So he's not the Father. He's not the Spirit. He's the Son of God, the Son of Man, who's Jehovah. And you're telling me that Matthew's not a Trinitarian. You're telling me that, Jesus, that Matthew doesn't believe Jesus is the God-man. Are you, is, are you following me, guys? In Jesus' name, let that number increase, not decrease. Hit that like button. In light of all this, do you think that Matthew 24, 36 is meant to deny that Jesus is God Almighty, equal to the Father in essence and glory and majesty and honor? You think that's Paul Matthew's point? The case he's been building up to Matthew 24, 36? He's now going to overturn all that he's established. And I'm going to show you that from Mark tomorrow, God willing. God willing, I'm going to show you that tomorrow from Mark. I decided to focus on Matthew because it makes my job a little easier. Okay, now, one more ev light of evidence for Matthew. And then we're going to unpack Matthew 24, 36. But I'm going to go more in depth in the second part of my response because God willing, Lord willing, tomorrow... I'm going to focus on Mark's witness. So you guys got to come back for Mark's witness, Lord willing, tomorrow, and invite more people. We want to get a 1,000 before because Jesus is worthy, right? And I'm going to try to be on the same time, God willing, tomorrow. 
I'll try to be on 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, which is New York time, Canadian time. I'll try to be on 3 p.m., so look for it. Okay, now, one more line of evidence from Matthew. Let's go to Matthew 23, 21. Matthew 23, 21. What an honor that God would set us apart and give us this wisdom to glorify him. And I happen to be one of them that God was pleased to use. Okay, now, Matthew 23, 21. And who so shall swear by the temple, sweareth by it, and by him that dwelleth therein. Okay, guys, did you catch it? If you swear by the temple, you swear by the temple and the one who lives in it. Who lives in the temple, according to the Bible? According to the Old Testament, whose presence filled the temple? Whose house did the temple belong to? Jehovah, right? Yahweh? God, right? So notice what Jesus said. Post it one more time, Matthew 23, 21. If you swear by the temple, you swear by it and the one who lives in it. Whether you like it or not, to swear by the temple, swear to God who lives in it. You catch it? You swear by the temple, you're swearing by the temple and the one who lives in it. So you're swearing by God. Notice it, right? You're taking an oath by the God who lives in the temple. Because here's where you're going to get blown away. Matthew 12, verse 6. Here's where you should get blown away. Matthew 12, verse 6. Matthew 12, verse 6. But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Wait, 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 wait. Jesus, you said if you swear by the temple, you're swearing by the temple and the one who lives in it. So if you say that there's someone greater than the temple, then that means he has to be greater than the temple and the one who lives in it. And Jesus is referring to himself. I am the one who's standing here who's greater than the temple. But hold on, Jesus. No one can be greater than God. And yet you just said you're greater than the temple. The only one who can be greater than the house is the owner of the house who lives in the house. Only the owner of the house is more important than the house and greater than the house. But you just said you are the one standing there and you're greater than the temple. But if you're not God and a creature, you just said you're greater than God according to your own logic. Because you said if you swear by the temple, you're swearing by the God who lives in it. So if I say I'm better than the temple, then I'm saying I'm better than the God who lives in it. That would be blasphemy. Unless, Jesus, you think that you're the God of the temple, and because you own the temple, the temple is yours, it's your house, then by golly, you are greater than the temple because the owner of the house is greater than the house. Wow. Wow. That's why, Jesus, you can be greater than the temple. Because you are the God of the temple, the owner of the temple, the Lord of the temple. It's your house. My goodness, who do you think you are? But then Matthew 12, 8. Two verses later, Matthew 12, 8. Matthew 12, verse 8. Two verses later. For the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. Oh my goodness. What are you doing to me? The Sabbath day is ordained by God. It's ordained by Jehovah. Jehovah owns the Sabbath. It's his Sabbath. And yet you say you're the Lord of the Sabbath. You're the owner of the Sabbath. You own the Sabbath. The Sabbath belongs to you. So you can tell people what they can and cannot do on the Sabbath. But you said you're the Son of Man. What's going on here? I'm, I can't handle this. Wait. Jesus, wait, wait, wait. You're greater than the temple, and you're the owner of the Sabbath. The Sabbath belongs to you. You own it. You're its Lord. You can tell people what they can and cannot do on the Sabbath. But Jesus, the temple belongs to Jehovah. He lives in it. And the Sabbath belongs to Jehovah. Who do you think you are? Leviticus 23, verse 3. Leviticus 23, verse 3. I like that. Panos Filippo. Leviticus 23, verse 3. The Sabbath belongs to who? Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest. A holy convocation. He shall do no work therein, 
It is the Sabbath of Jehovah in all your dwelling place. It's the Sabbath of Jehovah. The Sabbath that belongs to Jehovah. The Sabbath that belongs to the Lord Jehovah. And Jesus says, I own the Sabbath. I own it. I'm its Lord. It belongs to me. Exodus 31, 12 to 17. Exodus 31, 12 to 17. Exodus 31, 12 to 17. And Jehovah spake unto Moses, saying, Watch here. Exodus 31, 12 to 17. Jehovah spake unto Moses, Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths, my Sabbaths, not yours, they're mine, ye shall keep. For it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations. You may know that I am Jehovah the Lord that doth sanctify you. Ye shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone, everyone that defileth it shall surely be put to death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is a Sabbath of rest. Holy to Jehovah, set apart to Jehovah, because it's his Sabbath, my Sabbaths, they're mine. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. Because 17 says, it is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days, Jehovah made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day, he rested and was refreshed. So did you catch it? It's my Sabbath, says Jehovah. It's the Sabbath of Jehovah, the Lord. And Jesus says, I, the Son of Man, am the Lord of the Sabbath. You see it? So, folks, help me understand. I'm a little slow and I'm a little stupid. David Wood will tell you and Sai Christian will tell you. I'm a little slow and stupid. From Matthew chapter 1 all the way to 24, Matthew has gone out of his way to identify Jesus as Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh. Saying things about Jesus and Jesus says things about himself that the Old Testament applies to Jehovah alone. So let's ignore all that, and let's just focus on Matthew 24, 36. Matthew 24, 36. And say, see, Jesus doesn't know the day or hour, only the Father does. See, he's not God. That's what Matthew wants you to believe. Oh, you mean, forget what Matthew wrote in Matthew 1, Matthew 2, Matthew 3, Matthew 4, Matthew 5, Matthew 6, Matthew 7, Matthew 8. Forget all those chapters? Yeah, forget those chapters. Forget the fact that Jesus claims to be Jehovah. Who knows what only Jehovah can, can know? Who does what only Jehovah does according to the Old Testament? Who's worshipped with the worship that belongs to Jehovah? Forget all that. Ah, who cares? Focus on Matthew 24, 36. That's it. That's all. See, my Bible begins in Matthew 24, 36. That's where Matthew begins in my Bible. Matthew 24, 36. Oh, but you want to really get blown away? Matthew 24, 35, and Mark 13, 31. You really want to get blown away? The verse before Matthew 24, 36, and Mark 13, 32. The very verse before Matthew 24, 36, and Mark 13, 32. Let's look at Matthew 24, 35, and Mark 13, 31. The verse before that one says only the Father knows. Let's look at it. Matthew 24, 35. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. My words shall not pass away. That's the verse right before he says, only the Father knows. Now compare that to Isaiah 40, verse 8. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now let's read Isaiah 40, verse 8. Both Mark and Matthew record the same thing. Now let's compare what Jesus said. My words shall not pass away. Isaiah 40, verse 8. The grass withereth. The flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. What? It's God's word that will not pass away, stands forever. But in Mark 13, 31, Matthew 24, 35, the verse before the one that Jesus says, that they are our, only the Father knows. Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words, my words will never pass away. But Jesus, that's only true of the word of God. Why would you say that of your words? 
because God's words are my words. My words are God's words because I and the Father are one. We are both God. Oh. Hmm. So is it clear? Final point. Final point. Let's go to Mark 13, 32. And there's a part two tomorrow. There's a part two tomorrow, God willing. And I'm going to give you the real quick answer. I'm going to give you the real quick answer. And then tomorrow we're going to do part two, God willing. So Mark 13, 32. Let me put this. And I'm going to repeat this tomorrow. Okay, watch here. But of the day and that hour knoweth no man, no, not the angels which are in heaven, neither the Son but the Father. Now, I'm going to unpack this with greater depth tomorrow.